So we've done this. We've seen this. Let's jump into that. Okay? So this is how we get people better. Step one. And I did it in order. Foundations. Step one. I don't want you to get lost. Okay? Foundations. Again, we put patients on a low inflammatory, low mold diet. We have them do some stress management because if they're inflamed, we know that their stress response is impaired. Remember the teeter-totter relationship between cortisol and the immune system. Uh, we do some sleep support because patients often are not sleeping well. They're hyperexcited and they're usually, they usually have fragmented sleep. Uh, we also are very aggressive with our lipid replacement therapy. We are not using fish oil. We are doing other types of lipids that are really important to heal cell membranes. So uh, this is based on the work out of Patricia Kane, um, and I, I actually think it, it has uh, some real validity uh, in this patient population. It's not the end-all be-all. You know, it, it happens in a broader context. Um, but yes, we are basically doing an oil change. And what that means is um, the lipid content in the body often becomes injured as a result of this chronic inflammatory response. And so we begin to see the presence of abnormal lipids accumulating in the outer cell membrane and in the inner mitochondrial leaflets. And that means excess inflammatory response, poor cell-to-cell -cell communication, poor healing. So immediately we get patients on oral phosphatidylcholine, a balanced oil of omega-6 to 3. Uh, we use a mixture of safflower flax. We also often give them some electrolytes. And then wheat germ oil, which has polycosinol. Polycosinol, yes, has been shown to help lower cholesterol, but what it really is is a structural fat. So what happens is as the myelin sheath is degraded and excoriated literally from this condition, we want to give back lipids to rebuild the myelin. And so phosphatidylcholine, balance oil, and wheat germ oil will do that for us. At the same time, these individuals are hyper-excited in the brain and we need to do some things to immediately start reducing that neurologic inflammation. We know they failed their visual test, they have complaints of all sorts of cognitive issues, so we have access now to an extract of ginseng called RG3, which we combine with nicotinamide riboside into a compounded nasal spray. We also give them curcumin or turmeric, as well as resolvins. So resolvins are the extracts of fish oil, which help turn off inflammation in the body. So what is a low, so yes, what is a low mold diet? Well, there you go. So this is based in the literature. We know that uh, these 10 categories of food uh, will often carry mycotoxins. There was a question last night about real-time labs and whether or not that that's an accurate urine mold test. And the answer is no. All you're doing is actually tracking molds that have been ingested and then excreted in the, um, in the urinary system. And so these are the common foods that tend to be moldy. So we get patients off these foods right away. Actually, these patients are so hyperexcited, they do turn to alcohol because it helps sedate that neurologic inflammation. They get into trouble with this issue. So uh, stress response, I talked about this a little bit. Allostasis is the ability of the body to achieve stability through change. This is all the work from Bruce McEwen, an incredible researcher. Um, he also articulated the subcomponents of the stress response and that there's a reason why the body will go into a downregulated state to um, reduce that allostatic load. And so we perceive stress. We then have behavioral responsive, adaptive or maladaptive. We have these physiologic responses. Cortisol goes up. We activate um, our... Uh, acute stress response system to manage the stress, and then all of this is mediated through individual differences. And under stress, we should have a stressor and it goes back to normal. Over time, it can degrade. There are some individuals where they turn on their stress response and they actually can't turn it off, for genetic reasons mostly. And then for others, uh, they just can't mount a stress response. So this is a low allostatic load state, and this is the worst because of what I mentioned before. This is a normal salivary cortisol curve. Um, this is the mechanisms by which all of this is happening. So cortisol is released, and it feeds back to the brain. Uh, again, high levels of cortisol receptors in the hippocampus. We also see triggering of the cortex and the amygdala, um, and also influence on the immune system. And then the bi-directional relationship between the two. 
This is what happens when patients have too much stress. So the body turns down the stress response to protect itself. But there are consequences to this, probably the main one being excess immune activity. So this is what's going on. So when cortisol levels go up, we have systemic, uh, um, sorry, when cortisol levels are low, we have systemic inflammation from that flattened cortisol curve, triggering a microglial activation in the brain, uh, serotonin degradation because of indolamines in the digestive tract, and nonspecific symptoms of sickness. So there's this layering effect that occurs in patients who are under stress and they have a biotoxic exposure. So how do I protect the brain? Theanine, green tea extract, really good at binding to dopamine and GABA receptors. Uh, very safe. It's, a, it's an analog of glutamate. Um, it blunts NMDA. Uh, it also reduces norepi levels and reduces blood pressure, blocks the effects of caffeine. It's a single amino acid, so it induces both relaxation as well as focus because of the GABA and the dopamine components, and it also induces an alpha wave state, which is a meditative-like state. So I use a lot of theanine in my practice. Typical dose, you know, 200, even 400 milligrams several times a day in patients. It works really well. There's no known level of toxicity. There's no really upper limit of normal or, or safety for uh, theanine. Uh, in, in the U.S., they've uh, signified 1,200 milligrams per day, uh, but in the Japanese literature where all of this was developed, uh, they, they basically say you can take as much as you want. Um, plant sterilins, so if you're looking for a tool to help modulate the immune system, um, I like sterilins. These are not sterols or sterol esters, so sterols will reduce cholesterol. Sterolins come from nat natural pine bark, been used in Germany for 30 to 40 years, and they help balance the immune response, so Th1 to Th2. And it doesn't really matter uh, whether they're Th1 or Th2 dominant. It basically, in, and what, it, what they really do is actually raises Treg cells. Right? So Treg cells are low in SIRS. It raises Treg cell activity and rebalances Th1, Th2, and Th17 as a result. So I like plant sterilins a lot. RG3 is an extract of ginseng. Um, there's the RB line and the RG line. The RG3 in particular is the most neuroprotective. It induces repair of the brain, decreases neuroexcitation, blunts NMDA receptors, decreases uh, neurologic inflammation. This was originally looked at for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's because it actually showed repair in key areas of the brain. So I like RG3 quite a lot, especially in this patient population. They're so inflamed they will notice a difference. Uh, if you're relatively healthy and you do RG3, you might not notice much. Uh, it probably will be protecting your memory, but in patients that are really neurologically sick, uh, this stuff is, is pretty incredible. Um, so the dose is two milligram nasal spray, two sprays twice a day, uh, taken in uh, three months on, two week off cycle. Uh, in this patient population, they'll notice within the first couple weeks, and we've been tracking that data too. So. Um, we usually combine it with nicotinamide riboside. This is a vitamin B3 extract, well studied at Harvard. Uh, basically, this is brain food because it produces NAD. NAD is a important substrate in cell metabolism in the brain, so it's very neuroprotective. Uh, the Harvard Research Group specifically looked at this for memory loss, so um, we put this into the RG3 as well as the nasal spray. And you can do it orally, but I like it better as the, as, uh, with the RG3. In addition to that, so as you're gaining control of that neuroinflammation, you want to be doing your lipid replacement. We know that there's an accumulation of these very long chain fatty acids that occurs at the cell membrane level. We know this for certain because we send a test off to Johns Hopkins where we can assess for that. And we can see the presence of these aberrant fats that are getting in the way of normal cell metabolism. So even though you're going down the general path of turning off inflammation, you're correcting that underlying lipid abnormality. And so what happens is, as these um, very long chain fats accumulate, they form these lipid rafts and ceramides where cells start to stick together, and they become very non-functional, and that creates even more inflammation. So we have to work on uh, eliminating these very long chain fats. And interestingly, there's some nice data to show that Lyme itself feeds on the very uh, molecular compounds that are induced as part of the inflammation. So you want to get rid of them, and so here's some of the work on lipid exchange between you know, Borelli and host cells. Basically, uh, Lyme will look for these abnormal fats. And so you don't want them to have an energy substrate. So when you start normalizing the cell membrane and breaking them apart, Lyme has a hard time hopping from cell to cell and eating its way literally around your body.
because that's what it does. Sounds gross, right? Yeah. So these ceramide rafts are really important to target. And what, what's happening is there's this sort of epigenetic insult um, because of the inflammation. So you're getting these abnormal phospholipids that are um, being formed. Remember, you go from genomics to transcriptomics to proteomics to small metabolome. And so when these lipid uh, molecules are being formed, they're abnormally folded and they don't work properly. So we want to interfere with that. So this is a cell membrane. And this is what it looks like for uh, abnormal fat accumulation at the cell level. So we can see the presence of these very long chain fats, renegade fats, saturated odd fats, and trans isomers. We get rid of all of this with a very magical short chain fatty acid called butyrate. And so butyrate is something that you can get in foodstuffs. Uh, you can also take butyrate orally. It smells like stinky cheese. And people don't like it, but it works incredibly well. You don't want to start patients on butyrate right away. You just want to start by replacing these phospholipids first. Because if you start burning off all of this stuff, they actually feel worse before they feel better. So this neurolipid therapy is really important. The phosphatidylcholine, 1.8 grams twice a day. Balance oil, ratio of omega-6 to 3. Usually we do uh, 2 to 3,000 milligrams a day of this. The butyrate, which is short-chain uh, fatty acid, which causes beta-oxidation of these abnormal long-chain fats to burn off from the membrane. And then the wheat germ oil contains structural lipids to strengthen the membrane. So all of this is really important as a precursor. You're kind of just getting the patient ready to go in that regard. Um, so we're starting this right, uh, we're starting this right away um, until, so, so let's say they fail their visual test and they meet their symptoms or waiting for their labs and neuroquant to get back. We're starting them on this right away. They walk out the door with lipids. What about helping along? Uh, medium chains don't play a big role. They don't? No, not, not in this patient population. Um, curcumin, we know, we know curcumin um, is nice anti-inflammatory. It does get into the brain, uh, blocks NF-kappa-BD, 500 to 1,000 milligrams twice a day. SPM, so specialized pro-resolving mediators, um, these help to turn off the inflammatory response as well. Um, helps with downregulation of macrophages and microglial cells. So you're getting patients going on some lipid replacement, okay? Now, this is just the beginning as you're gathering more data. Remember, they're doing a visual test. They're doing blood labs. They're doing a neuroquant. You know, so that takes a little time. It can take up to six weeks to get all the information back. So you want to get them going on something to make them feel better. That means turn off their brain inflammation and start replacing lipids and get them on a low mold diet. So that's the foundation. So now we want to go into exposure elimination. I'm going to um, skip over some of this. So I have... Uh, some nice slides on uh, botanicals for Lyme, and then also a little bit on, on mold remediation. So we know that we have to deal with multiple pathogens simultaneously. If you're bit by a tick, we like to say it's the dirty needle of nature. And so, yes, there's Lyme, but it often comes with buddies, co-infections, as we call them. Bartonella, Babesia, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, viruses, fungal elements. It's just a m toxic soup of stuff that you're going to have to deal with. And oftentimes, we don't really know exactly all the pathogens that are present. So we really just tend to focus on the diagnosis of Lyme, and we assume that some of these other bugs are there, because there aren't great tests for Bartonella and Babesia. Those are the big three. But we always treat for all of them. We don't just treat for Lyme. So we also know that there's different forms of Lyme. So once it starts being treated, it'll go into the cyst or L form. These are reduced forms that decrease its surface area, turn off uh, cell metabolism, and hide uh, from the treatment itself. So it's, it's basically trying to weather the storm. Um, again, in addition to that, we're having to deal with some of other factors as well. And they love to hide. So we call them stealth pathogens, this notion that as they change shape and they reduce their ability to be treated, um, we have to be smart about uh, our treatment approach. And that includes having therapies that deal with these reduced forms, but also uh, their other defense mechanisms, the big one being biofilm. So biofilm is a protein goo. Essentially, it's a structure that it's secreted by various bugs, including marcons. And it creates a ladder-like structure inside of which the bug is harbored and survives. And it's a physical defense mechanism uh, from which they can prevent the immune cells from tracking and, and, and killing them. Um, also, it forms a community in which 
other pathogens can coaggregate and therefore trade DNA and enhance their uh, defense mechanisms. So biofilms are something that we really want to, to deal with uh, in the context uh, of, these, uh, of these infections. So these are the big three. Babesia is actually a parasite. Bartonella is a bacteria, and so is Borrelia. Borrelia is a spirochete, so it's a corkscrew-shaped uh, pathogen, um, and it's very good at kind of twisting right through tissue planes. And again, it's feeding on those very long-chain fats and hopping from cell to cell when they start rafting together. So Babesia is a malarial-like pathogen, and so we use anti-malarials for uh, Babesia, um, which is very common. So uh, it's very hard to identify on testing. Bartonella, gram-negative bacteria, slow growing, so is Lyme slow growing, um, linked with a variety of illnesses. The, these two infections are very hard to detect. Uh, Lyme, even though that one is difficult, I think is easier than Bartonella and Babesia. Again, so we typically treat for all three. So we know over 300,000 people have been accurately diagnosed with Lyme, and it's probably even 10 times that in the United States because of our poor detection methods. And interestingly, again, up to two-thirds of infected individuals who can fail will fail conventional therapy um, either because of the bug's ability to hide, but probably more likely the fact that these are people that are just remaining inflamed. So artemisinin, uh, this has been used for a long time. Uh, it's uh, wormwood, uh, originally used in China, and it's a very potent antiparasitic. Um, we use it specifically for Babesia, and even the World Health Organization recommends artemisinin, extracts of artemisinin, uh, for uh, malarial-like infections. This is probably the, the botanical that has the strongest literature in my mind. So wide-ranging effects is an antiparasitic. Uh, good for toxoplasmosis. I've diagnosed a number of patients with bipolar disorder because of their toxo infection. And so when we treat them appropriately, their bipolar goes away. It has some nice antiviral properties to it. You'll often see re-expression of Epstein-Barr, or even CMV in this patient population because of the immune dysfunction. And so artemisinin is nice in that regard. Um, I'll also do, when they have presence of viruses, monolaurin, uh, as well as oil of oregano. Um, and, I, and I cheat and I'll do high-dose uh, valcyclovir uh, as well. So I, I do reach for the prescription pad when I see patients with chronic viral infections. So here's myrrh. So myrrh is an interesting botanical uh, because of its wide-ranging antibacterial properties to it. It's been around for a long time as well. Um, there aren't a lot of herbs that I think are reliable with respect to um, dealing with the microbial load. And there's some nice uh, clinical studies that have been published on high-dose myrrh. Uh, interestingly, um, you know, what the research has shown is that, you know, you have to pulse these things. So um, there's different regimens that um, I, I know will be talked about later, um, and we can distribute some of that as well um, on how to pulse these things, but you don't want to give them every day. Um, interestingly, um, there, there's a body of research literature on pulsing antibiotics in chronic infections too. Uh, higher dose, intermittent, to basically let the bug not adapt to the, uh, to the treatment. You want to break down biofilm. This is the goo. And uh, there are ways to do it. Um, so garlic, oregano oil, tannin-based herbs, um, xylitol, and lactoferrin um, have all been shown to help break down biofilm. And then for the prescribers in the room, you can also do EDTA. So EDTA is very good at, at reducing biofilm. So you've reduced inflammation. You've started doing lipid replacement. Um, you're dealing with the exposure issue. So you might be reaching for some botanicals for the infection, and that means being treated with these herbs for probably 9 to 12 months in a pulsing fashion. Okay? Again, uh, if you're able to prescribe or you're able to convince a prescriber, the way I do it in my practice is if I diagnose Lyme, it's 30 days of doxycycline, standard of care, and then I switch them to the herbs, and I park them on those herbs for the duration of their treatment. Okay? Uh, it can take a long time to get rid of these bugs. Um, I also cheat because sometimes for resistant infections, 
I'll do something called intravenous UV light therapy, uh, which is also a very potent antimicrobial. But the herbs are actually pretty good at clearing the infections over time, but it takes time. So just be patient. So they're going to be on lipids for the duration of therapy. They're going to be on the curcumin and the RG3 and resolvins for the duration of therapies. So you're just getting them going. You've modified their diet, and you're starting to treat their bugs if they have bugs. If they don't have bugs and you're just dealing with mold, the patient is then instead dealing with remediation. Okay, so it means that their ERMI score was above 2, and they're looking for mold. And maybe they had mold-related changes in their neuroquant. So how do we reduce the toxic burden? This is really the start of that triangle protocol. Okay, so um, we, I have done some preload in the sense of there's data on lipids, there's data on RG3, there's data on curcumin. Here's some um, recommendations for botanicals for chronic infections. Um, but now we're actually getting into the meat of the triangle. And so the first component is reducing that neurologic inflammation. And the goal is for them to pass their visual test. And to do that, we have to understand that this sort of chronic remixing or the enterohepatic circulation is the whole game for reducing inflammation. And you can do that a couple different ways. Um, the first is you can prescribe something called cholestyramine. Cholestyramine is an old medication that was a bile acid sequestrant. It was used to lower cholesterol by binding it to cholesterol in the digestive tract. It turns out that cholestyramine has the perfect confirmation of a positive ion so that it binds to the negatively charged ion of the mycotoxin and the inflammagens. Now, clay, chlorella, charcoal, zeolite, uh, I don't know, I um, guess that's it. They don't work. They're billed as binders, but they're all negatively charged. So they actually repel the inflammagens. We know that the size of the, uh, of the, um, the mycotoxin and the inflammagens are about 1.4 angstroms, and that's exactly the size of the cholestyramine binding site. Amazing. So we have been on a hunt to find something natural that could act as a substitute for a prescription, okra. There's one comparative study in the literature that shows that okra has similar binding properties to cholestyramine, but at a much weaker extent. So somewhere between 16 and 20 percent of cholestyramine's binding affinity for these mycotoxins. It is key to getting people feeling better. One way or the other, you need to get them on a binder. And the cholestyramine is exquisitely good. There's a step down from that called well call. So well call is a tablet form of this powder. The powder is usually given three to four times a day. The well call is given three times a day. You give it 30 minutes before meals. And why, why do you do that? So you, you have the binder in the gut, and then they eat 30 minutes later. The gallbladder squeezes, squeezes a bunch of inflammatory proteins right into the waiting cholestyramine. If you don't have that, you can switch to okra. And so we're, we're going to start looking at okra as a substitute for us because We've, we've really wanted to find a natural binder that had some literature behind it. And it turns out that okra works just like cholestyramine. So kudos to Sarah in that regard. So um, it, it depends for, for, the, for the okra. Um, but you're going you're gonna to see anywhere from you know, 50 to 100 milligrams. Um, but I, I think you're probably going to have to take a ton. You know, probably have to double or triple the recommended amount of okra uh, per, per recommended dose. And it, it'd be safe to do. And you would still do it 30 minutes before meals. I also want them to be on soluble fiber because once the inflammatory proteins are bound, they need to poop them out. Mm -hmm. So if they're constipated, this doesn't work. So make sure that they're moving their bowels. And also, because they're on a binder, you want them on a multivitamin and mineral. Uh, you also want them on some ox bile to help emulsify the inflammatory proteins, and then even a little bit of N-acetylcysteine to keep things moving through the liver. Okay? 
So once you do your biotoxin management for one to two months, you want them to retake the visual test, and hopefully they pass. If they fail, start looking for ongoing exposure. So one way or the other, you need them to pass the visual test before they move on to the second step of therapy. Once they do pass, then you're going to leave them on the binder, you're going to leave them on these other products, and you're going to swab their nose for the Marcons. And so it's a deep nasal swab, you send it off to the company, and then you get a report back, positive or negative, negative, and how much. It'll say small, moderate, or large amount of Marcons. Um, you will then treat them with a nasal spray. And there actually is some literature now on silver nasal spray. So that is an alternative for you uh, if you can't prescribe. Otherwise, the original research was done on a Bactroban, EDTA, and Gentamicin spray. But we're now looking at just Bactroban and EDTA. We think that might, in fact, be just enough to clear the Marcons. They treat for six weeks. They then re-swab. Once they're uh, clear of their Marcons, they then go to this third step, which is dealing with GI health. In the standard approach, they say, well, just deal with anti-gliadin antibodies. Well, we're much better than that. We know that there are other food triggers that, might, that also might be further inflaming the individual. So we tend to do a food panel, maybe a functional digestive test, and this is when we add in the butyrate. So we start clearing out the abnormal long chain fats from the cell membrane, but we're also feeding the digestive tract in the meantime. So yeah, they've been on a low mold diet, but now we're gonna refine that. And what I do is we do our food panel, we look at a, a GI functional test, and I hand them off on this step to my dietitian who then reviews, reviews the food panel, reviews the diet, makes sure they're on butyrate, and we begin to really narrow down that inflammatory drive. And you think about it, in this step, they've reduced their neurologic inflammation. In this step, they've, reviewed, they've reduced their upper respiratory tract source of inflammation. And then now, they're reducing a third engine of inflammation, which is the gut. And if you want to invoke some other therapies or strategies for treating their gut, by all means do it. But this is a step uh, on the treatment path that has been validated, but I'm expanding it because I know you guys are much better at this than just dealing with gluten. We're beyond gluten. Can you use glutamine at this point? Um, you can use glutamine at this point. So we're disrupting enterohepatic circulation by giving a bile acid sequestrant. Cholestyramine uh, is really like glue. Um, it's a quaternary ammonium with 1.43 angstroms, and the, size, the shape and size of the positive charge interacts with the net negative charge found uh, in parts of the biotoxins, which are 1.41 angstroms. So this gets into sort of you know, molecular conformation, but this is why the charcoals and clays and chlorellas of the world just don't work very well, because they don't have the right binding shape, they don't have the right charge, and they don't have the right conformation. So you won't find patients really effectively passing the visual test until you get them on something that's really specific. We now have an answer for that um, in addition to a prescription, which is something like okra. So here's the actual structure of the, um, uh, the, um, the biotoxin itself. And here's the study that Sarah pulled on okra. So we have a range of effect. 16 to 34% of activity of cholestyramine. So that's what they actually com uh, compared it to. 100% was cholestyramine as the standard. Uh, there were other things that they also used as vegetable matter, but okra was by far the best. So you can actually find okra um, as a, uh, as a, as a uh, over-the-counter. Uh, here's our Marcons. So um, these, again, are genomically active. Once they pass the visual test, you're swabbing their nose. Um, and you want to clear this infection. They do make biofilm. Um, they're found in dogs' noses, but not cats, in wet buildings, also in dental issues, too, and even joints. So I just had a patient who's incredibly sick from mold, but we also discovered a decaying tooth. So on Monday, he had the tooth pulled, and now we're treating it. And we also swabbed his mouth for Marcon's, and we're sending it off to the company. Uh, Microbiology DX. Microbiology DX. So this is the uh, toxin. It's called a palytoxin. It's quite small. It's directly neurotoxic. So you can imagine 
This staph infection is living in the deep nasal passages, releasing a palytoxin right through the olfactory bulb and creating direct damage to the brain. So yes, you're reducing neurologic inflammation by giving things like curcumin and RG3 and resolvins and lipid replacement, but you're also giving a binder to pull inflammation out of the digestive tract, which actually drains inflammation from the brain, so they can pass the visual test, but you also have to deal with the secondary source. So you gotta clear the Marcons, it's really important. In fact, this is one of the criteria for doing that final step of VIP. You can't treat with VIP until you've gotten rid of the Marcons. Um, oh, the other thing is we often see prescribers make the mistake of adding in intraconazole. So they'll do a BEGI spray. What we're finding is this is actually inducing resistance patterns uh, in bacteria in the noses. So if you do it, stop because you're actually creating more harm. Just do BEG or BEGI. Um, and it's, it's actually causing a resistance of vancomycin. Um, and there's no good reason to add the itraconazole into the BEG spray. So do BEG or BE only. Um, or you can do silver. Silver is the long way around. I had a patient that took him six months to get rid of his Marcons with silver, but he did it. BE is still, uh, -E still six weeks. So BEG, Bactroban, EDTA, Gentamicin. This is the dose. Most compound, many compounding pharmacists will now know if you just order BEG spray, they'll know what you're talking about. There's some side effects. You can get nose irritation, even nose bleeds. Um, no known drug interactions. You can do BE spray. Um, you can also add xylitol to break down the biofilm, although EDTA does that pretty well. And others have used nebulized iodine and Lugol solution, um, but you know, I think silver is a better choice in that regard. So you've passed the visual test, you've cleared their Marcons, you've worked on their digestive tract, and I would say you do that for four to six weeks. And then we go to the, 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 the next step, which is step four, which is metabolic balance. And that is, this is when I add a little bit of detox. By this point, they're less inflamed, and they're able to then start mobilizing other types of toxins. So I want to make sure that their pH is above 6.5. And what I'll do is I'll add in some chlorella, three grams twice a day. Here's where clay can be helpful, even more uh, okra a topical glutathione to start mobilizing uh, heavy metals and chemicals. Chlorella is quite good in particular for PCBs. Uh, top, so it's a spray or, or gel? Liposomal. You can do a liposomal. Uh, or you can just leave them on the N-acetylcysteine. I'll do that for four weeks or so to start mobilizing the, hev the heavy metals and chemicals. And then uh, we move into hormone balance. And strict criteria is we look at just DHEA. Uh, and then replace with DHEA. But I like to do a full urine sample, and that'll give me both reproductive hormones and DHEA and cortisol patterns. And depending on what uh, comes back, so I use the precision analytics, uh, the Dutch test. Uh, it's quite good, uh, very accurate. And then if they have upregulated aromatase, so if it comes back and their testosterone is low and their estrogen and estradiol are high, then I'll give them some chrysin as well as some bilberry. So uh, both of those will block down on the aromatase enzyme. Um, and then we'll work on balancing their reproductive hormones. You can give them DHEA 25 to 50 milligrams daily. Note that these are higher than normal doses even for women. They need that in this patient population. You might also want to have them do BHRT uh, or they can do just natural balancing. So if you want to do, you know, uh, Chase berry and, and black cohosh and, and other things to try and normalize and dim to normalize their hormone balance. Um, so whatever comes back on the test, you're going to have to deal with in that regard. But this is the step where you start looking at hormones. Um, and, and the strict one within the triangle is just DHEA, though. So if you just want to punt and do DHEA alone, you can do that. So once their uh, hormones have normalized, you do pre and post. You then move on to electrolyte and water balance. This is a difficult one. So you guys have a lot of tools in your toolkit, 
but for the non-prescribers, I don't have a good answer for you on how to deal with this. And this is the low ADH and osmolality. We cheat and we use a prescription called desmopressin or DDAVP, which induces production of ADH in the hypothalamus. And so we get ADH levels up. Now, um, you only need to do this um, every other night for seven to nine doses. That's all that it takes to get the brain making ADH again. Common heavy metal chelators, DMSA, EDTA, DMPS, chloralapines, PCBs, I like chlorella a lot. Bilberry, very good for blocking aromatase. It also helps to uh, shore up those uh, weakened collagen fibers, um, helps to improve brain capillary integrity. As an antioxidant, it's really important uh, in this patient population. Uh, standardized 25% dosage uh, in its sort of reduced form of standardized extract is 80 milligrams twice a day. Question. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't do an alcohol-based bilberry. Yeah. All right, so you've gotten them through passing the visual test, clearing their Marcons, healing their gut, beginning to detoxify them, balancing their hormones, and correcting their ADH osmolality. You're now in the final step of therapy, which is resolution and repair. So you want to manage their destructive enzymes of elevated MMP9, so protecting their connective tissue. You're then going to go into a mode of decreasing their innate immune activation if they have an elevated C3A, C4, or TJ beta-1. By now, you're months into therapy, you probably want to remeasure these markers because what we find is sometimes they started off with a high MMP9, but now it's normal because you've done all, all this work on their gut and food and hormones and other things. Um, and the same is true for these markers as well, the C3A, C4A, and the TGF beta-1. And then finally, you end with the VIP. So um, if their MMP9 is high, meaning above 332, Boswellia is very good for blocking MMP9 and also pulling amylose out of the diet. So amylose is a type of starch, and it's found in root vegetables, for example. So amylose can trigger MMP9. So we get them on a low amylose diet. This is what a low amylose diet is. Boswellia, gum resin, it's the Indian frankincense, and it's the um, extract of frankincense that's the most potent anti-inflammatory of that, because frankincense is not as anti-inflammatory as Boswellia itself. There's lots of studies in the literature. Typically, it's 400 milligrams two to three times a day to blunt MMP9 production. Um, the, I'll point out, to reduce C3A if it was elevated, red yeast rice and CoQ10. To reduce C4A, we do high dose fish oil in a three to two ratio, uh, two grams twice a day, and then we can add in some resolvents. So once their MMP9 is normalized, we then give them some natural products to normalize their C3A and C4A. That then triggers you to go to the, final, uh, the second to last step of therapy, which is TGF beta-1. You can use a blood pressure medication called Losartan, 25 to milligram, 50 milligrams a day, to lower TGF beta-1, but bilberry and carnitine have also been shown to lower TGF beta-1. So carnitine, I pulled some studies on how it lowers TGF beta-1. Resveratrol, I pulled some studies on how it lowers TGF beta-1, um, similar to bilberry. And then we're finally on the last step. So all these other labs have normalized. They pass their visual test. Their Marcon's free. Everything is back to normal. Uh, they have a normal lipase. Um, but you still have that genomic activation. So we give them VIP, the vasoactive intestinal peptide. And uh, so this corrects the brain-related changes as well as the genomic response. So it, um, so it repairs that interstitial edema and the atrophy uh, in the central nervous system. And it's pretty magical in that regard. We don't know how it works to influence that ribosomal or mitochondrial gene regulation, but we know several transcription factors are also been shown to dif be differentially expressed after administration of VIP. 
And so without VIP, a lot of these markers really won't go back to fully normal. So MSH will start to climb. If you notice, there's no specific step for MSH. It's just as the total approach to therapy is working and we're reducing inflammation, MSH will climb. But VIP will push it above that, 30, that lower limit of 35. Um, so the dosage is 50 micrograms. It's a spray in each nostril four times a day. Um, and this has 30 days. It really should be two to six months. You want to monitor their visual tests, C4A, TGF beta 1, and a fasting lipase. And if levels are improving, you can taper their VIP dose to two doses over the next several months. And then you want to recheck their labs after six months of stopping uh, VIP. So basically, it's two to six months of VIP daily and you're checking their labs along the way to make sure that um, they continue to improve. Now you might find, as part of, if you go back to earlier in the day, um, the criteria for doing VIP, it was a, an ERMI less than two, a normal lipase, a cleared Marcons, for example. What it didn't include was a normal C4A or TGF beta one. Sometimes you give fish oil or carnitine or bilberry, whatever it's gonna be, and those levels are coming down, but they haven't fully normalized. That's okay because VIP is going to push them over the edge and fully normalize those labs as well. So if they meet criteria and they're still a little inflamed, not a big deal. VIP will correct that final issue for them. So a little bit of side effects. It will immediately dilate blood vessels. This is how we get people breathing again. Um, they can be a bit dysphoric because of NMDA receptor activation. Uh, and so we check them again at six months, we repeat their neuroquant, we review all their labs and their symptoms, and everything should be back to normal uh, once they complete their course of therapy for VIP. So that's it. That's all. That's all. <laughs>